is what they chose for a coffin in his burial? This? You have devoured my family. Neither parent accompanied that baby to the nursery. Tell them how you caused that injury. I failed as a mother. I'm sorry. Cases like this one are always so rough to hear, but sharing these stories is so important because things like this happen every day. Parents who choose drugs, partying, or convenience over their own children, yet they choose to keep their children with them in their home to suffer. Why? Maybe some of these sick monsters enjoy watching the pain of others. Maybe they don't want to admit what they're doing to their child and letting them go is just admitting their guilt. Who knows? But at the end of the day, as true crime consumers, it is our job to learn from these cases and keep our eyes out for red flags and take action whenever we can. Because what happened to Dylan never should have been allowed to happen. And once you hear the details of everything this poor baby suffered, you will never forget his story. But before we get into a case that will be sure to stress you out, I want to talk about a game that I like to play to relax, and that game is Love and Pies. Love and Pies is the best game to play when I'm tired after a long day and I'm looking for something relaxing yet engaging and fun while cozying up in my house after work. It's also a really great game to play while I'm traveling or waiting at the airport to pass the time. Love and Pies is the cutest free-to-play Merge 2 mobile game that you can play on your phone or tablet. Ever since I started playing months ago, I cannot get enough. In Love and Pies, your aim is to match fitting ingredients to create pies and other baked goods to then take and serve to your eager customers. Then you earn tips along the way to finance all the upgrades and decorations you want for your cafe, which is one of my favorite parts of the game. I love getting to make design choices and build up my own cafe from the ground up. Plus, when you play, you will just be blown away by Love and Pie's stunning visuals and animations. They truly create an immersive experience that makes creating your own business that much more enjoyable. Right now, there's a special event going on. It's Halloween in Appleton, and they have cooked up the spookiest two-week event. You can help Kate host a spooky costume party by renovating the cabin for the event. You can unlock a new beautiful area and enjoy milestone rewards like boosters, currency, and decoration upgrades. This event is perfect for anyone who loves seasonal immersive content. Now, Love and Pies wanted to do something special for the viewers of this channel. Everyone that downloads Love and Pies using my unique link down below, then plays until day three, will receive an amazing gift via the inbox message. You will get 200 energy and 50 gems. You will find out quickly how important those are to the game. Download now for free using the link in the description box below to get your super sweet surprise gift delivered to your inbox. Don't wait. Download Love and Pies now, available on iOS and Android, and join me in some fun, relaxing gameplay. Thank you again so much to Love and Pies for partnering with me on today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the horrifying case of Dylan Groves. Dylan James Groves was born on January 10th, 2019 in Otway, Ohio to Jessica and Daniel Groves. I wish I could tell you all about Dylan and who he was as a child, but he only got to spend two very short months on earth before his life was taken from him. Dylan's life started on a very rough note, and although he did spend a few weeks in the care of a mother who loved and deeply cared for him, he would ultimately be returned to the very people who wanted nothing to do with him. According to a nurse who helped deliver Dylan on the morning of Dylan's birth by around 5.30 a.m., Jessica and Daniel came into the hospital appearing flat, disconnected, and uncooperative. It was clear that Jessica was very pregnant and about to give birth. She was completely dilated and having contractions, but she didn't appear to be in any pain. She and Daniel also refused to answer pretty much any questions about prenatal care. Any time it looked like Daniel was about to answer the nurse's questions, Daniel would make eye contact with Jessica, then would end up not answering. This whole situation was very strange to the nurse because she'd never seen a woman so calm and deny being in pain despite being in active labor. It was very obvious to hospital staff that both parents had something to hide, which is why they wouldn't answer those questions. About 30 minutes after Jessica's arrival to the hospital, Dylan was born. 
At the time, Dylan was actually a month early. He was having difficulty breathing, so he ended up going to the nursery where he stayed for several days. He was initially treated with oxygen before being weaned off. He also had signs of tremors and was having a hard time self-soothing, crying constantly, and being unable to calm down. After his birth, both Jessica and Dylan were tested for drugs. Turns out, Jessica's urine tested positive for amphetamines, while baby Dylan tested positive for amphetamines, fentanyl, opioids, and morphine. At some point during all of this, Jessica did admit that she didn't do her prenatal visits because she had been on heroin most of her pregnancy, so she was too high most of the time to remember those doctor's appointments. As Dylan was being treated in the nursery, neither of his parents seemed concerned for his well-being at all. Even after his birth, Jessica didn't want to hold Dylan. Dylan was with his parents for a total of 15 minutes, and that entire time, neither parent seemed at all interested in their new baby. The hospital ended up keeping Dylan for five days to monitor him for withdrawal symptoms. After those five days, he was then discharged and placed into the care of social services. By January 15th, after some back and forth with the courts, Dylan was ultimately placed with a foster mother, Andrea Bowling. After being placed into Andrea's care, she watched as baby Dylan suffered through symptoms of drug withdrawal. He suffered through tremors. His legs and arms would randomly jerk and shake. He was constantly sweating and became hysterical any time Andrea put him down. He wanted to be held at all times times. While Dylan was under Andrea's care, Jessica and Daniel were allowed visitation to see Dylan. During those visits, Andrea noted that Jessica appeared loopy and out of it. She felt that Jessica was obviously still on drugs and was not in a position to care for Dylan. She was flat, unemotional, and uncaring during those visits. However, after Dylan was placed into foster care, Daniel fought to gain back custody of Dylan. He claimed that he wasn't on drugs and he had no idea that Jessica had been using. He had passed a drug screen after Dylan was born and had no prior criminal history or any prior involvement with Child Protective Services. I do want to note that Jessica and Daniel did have an older child as well, 14-year-old Daniel Jr. There had been some reports concerning Daniel's well-being, but he had never been removed from his father's care, so there was never any actual official involvement with the child welfare system. So the courts decided to do a team meeting with Daniel to speak with him and get him to understand what was required of him should Dylan be returned to his care. In that meeting, he spoke with Dylan's caseworker as well as Andrea, Dylan's foster mom. They informed Daniel that he needed to pass another drug screening. Him and Jessica both needed to go to individual counseling. Jessica needed to attend weekly drug treatments and Jessica was not allowed to live in the home with the family. She needed to stay away. The biggest concern at this time was Jessica's drug use. That is what posed a danger to Dylan. So if she was out of the house and completing her drug treatment, social services saw no issue with Daniel caring for Dylan. At that time, Daniel did take another drug test and passed. However, I do want to note that no one was actually present when Daniel was taking the drug test. No one watched him or was in the room with him when he actually took the test. That is obviously concerning and definitely raises some questions in terms of accuracy. Either way, because Daniel passed that drug screen, Dylan was placed back into his care by January 28, 2019, after 12 days spent in foster care. I will note that social services did technically maintain custody of Dylan, but as a part of the family reunification process, they placed him back into Daniel's care full time. When Andrea returned Dylan to his father, she gave him all sorts of things to help out with his care. Formula, diapers, his blanket, a quilt from the hospital, some pictures of him, as well as a Bible. She also gave Jessica and Daniel her phone number, telling them to call her if they needed absolutely anything. Lastly, she wrote them a letter detailing just how much she loved Dylan and how much she cared about him. She asked if she could maybe be involved in his life in one way or another. Maybe they could at least keep her updated as he reached his milestones. Just something so she could stay connected to the sweet baby boy who she cared for. But 
Jessica and Daniel would never reach out to Andrea for help. She was not allowed to take any part in his life. After returning Dylan to Daniel's care, by February 4th, Dylan's caseworker, Patricia Kraft, conducted her first home visit. During the visit, Dylan appeared quiet, content, and had no additional injuries. They confirmed that Jessica was in drug treatment and reminded her to continue her treatment indefinitely. After that first visit for the weeks that followed, Patricia made many attempts to get into touch with Daniel and Jessica, but they stopped responding. She showed up to their home, but no one was there. She even went to Daniel Jr.'s school and gave him a note asking that his father get into contact with her, which they did not do. By February 25th, Patricia was finally able to see Dylan and complete her assessment. Once again, she determined that the house and Dylan were clean, Dylan was appropriately dressed, and he had no further obvious injuries. Daniel told Patricia that Dylan was attending his doctor visits where he was said to be gaining weight appropriately. Daniel informed Patricia that Jessica was staying at the house during the days but she was not living there, so there was no risk to Dylan. After this, the next visit was scheduled for March 18th. However, when time came for this visit, Daniel informed Patricia that he was out of town visiting his sick father. They rescheduled the visit for March 21st, but once again, when Patricia showed up, nobody was home. By the following week, Daniel and Jessica had a court hearing. Jessica showed up to the hearing, but Daniel did not. At this hearing, it was said that Jessica was not following through with her required treatment. She had attended a few individual sessions and one group session in February, but after that, she was very inconsistent. At the hearing, it was decided that it was in Dylan's best interest to return to the care of family and child services. By March 28th, Patricia was finally able to complete the next home visit. There, she interacted with Daniel, Jessica, and Dylan. Dylan appeared to be healthy with no visible injuries. Things appeared to be going just fine. So she left after reminding them of her next home visit, which was scheduled for April 9th. But once again, when time came for that home visit, Daniel texted Patricia saying that they went up north to visit his father again, but their car broke down so they weren't able to make it home for a while. Then they had another court hearing scheduled but this time, neither Daniel or Jessica made it. Once again, it was ordered that Dylan needed to be returned to the care of the state. Throughout the remainder of April, Patricia tried a few more times to get into contact with the family. She went to their home, leaving them cards in their mailbox, asking them to call her. At one point, Daniel did text Patricia saying that they were still up north, but that Dylan is doing great and is growing like a weed. He said that he would be back home in the next few days, but as days passed, Patricia still could not get a hold of them to do the visit. After several more failed attempts at contacting them, Patricia went to Daniel Jr.'s school. When she saw him, she said that Daniel Jr. appeared nervous and was a bit dodgy with answering questions. He told Patricia that Dylan was just fine, but he admitted that Jessica was still living at the home with them before sort of changing his answer and saying that Jessica only sometimes lived with them. She then asked him about his grandfather up north, who Daniel claimed to be visiting, but Daniel Jr. had no idea who she was talking about. At that point, it was decided that Daniel Jr. be placed into the state's care until they figure out what's going on. They immediately placed him with an aunt and an uncle, and it was only after Daniel Jr. was taken that Daniel finally got back into contact with Patricia to ask her where Daniel Jr. was. She notified him that they took Daniel Jr. and requested that they bring Dylan into the agency immediately. He said he would, but of course, he did not. Patricia tried visiting the home once again, and this time there were cars parked in the driveway, but once again, nobody was answering the door. After all of this, finally, by April 30th, after not seeing Dylan for over a month now, Patricia filed a missing persons report for Dylan. For the month that followed, social service workers attempted to visit the home several more times. Each time, there were cars present, but when they tried getting inside or even speaking with Daniel or Jessica, they were getting nothing. Then, about two weeks after the missing persons report was filed, a law enforcement officer finally visited the home to speak with the couple. 
Once again, they knocked on the door, but got no answer. At that point, they spoke with a neighbor who said that they often saw Jessica and Daniel riding around the area on ATVs, leaving early in the morning and coming back late at night. During that interview with the neighbor, the officer did actually see Daniel riding past them on his ATV and he tried chasing him down, but Daniel headed into the woods and the officer lost sight of him. For the weeks that followed, officers continued following up with Daniel and Jessica, but were getting no closer to locating Dylan. Finally, by June 10th, 2019, officers obtained a search warrant for the Grove's home. Officers surrounded the home, ordering Jessica and Daniel to come out. It actually took 20 minutes of waiting, but Jessica finally exited the home. At that time, she was clearly volatile and agitated. She screamed and cursed at the officers, informing them that Patricia, their social worker, had already taken Dylan, so he was no longer in their care. They finally apprehended Jessica, but still, Daniel wouldn't come out. He barricaded himself inside and refused to move. After six hours of trying to negotiate, officers ended up sending a robot camera into the home to locate Daniel, and finally, they they were able to get Daniel out of the home as well. At that time, Daniel told them that he was sleeping that entire time, so that's why he wouldn't come out. He too told officers that social services had already taken Dylan into their custody. Officers reached out to Patricia to confirm this, obviously, but of course, she told them that she hadn't seen Dylan since that March 28th visit. No one had seen Dylan in over a month and a half at this point. After apprehending Daniel and Jessica, the search of their home was executed. Inside, they found no sign of Dylan anywhere. At this point, officers were still hoping that he was alive and maybe they just gave Dylan away to a family member or something like that. But obviously, none of this was looking good. After taking Daniel and Jessica into police custody, of course, they were both interviewed. According to the officer in Jessica's interview, she appeared very standoffish and cold. She didn't want to talk to the officer and appeared very annoyed at the situation. She maintained that social services took Dylan from them. In his interview at first, Daniel also said that social services took Dylan. According to the officer, Dylan also appeared dope sick, meaning that he was showing symptoms of withdrawal from opioids. He said that he would not give them any information until they allowed him to speak with Jessica, so they did. They allowed him a phone call, which was recorded. In that phone call, officers heard Daniel say, in part, if they find his body and find out where he had a broken arm and shit, we're effed. It doesn't matter. They don't know where he's at. I don't know where he's at. Obviously, this was very concerning to hear and pretty much confirmed everyone's worst fears, that baby Dylan was most likely dead. After this jail call, Daniel was interviewed once again, and this time he admitted that Dylan was not taken by social services. And after some pushing, Daniel finally admitted that he knew Dylan was actually dead. He claimed that one day he found Dylan deceased in his crib. He claimed to have nothing to do with his death, but he said that he could lead them to where they put his body to cover up his death. At first though, Daniel actually did not plan on showing authorities the real location of Dylan's body. He first brought them to the woods near his home, but authorities searched all around the area and found nothing. After this, authorities told Daniel that he needed to give them the real location. And finally, he told them to search in a well located at the Mount Hope Bible Camp about two miles away from the Grove's residence. Authorities gathered several volunteer firefighters to help with searching the well. They initially tried to go down a logging road to enter from the bottom of the well, but there was too much water in the area to gain access. So instead, they drained the well of its 13 feet of water and then got a crane to drop hooks into the well to retrieve whatever was inside. And after around three hours of draining and searching around the well with the crane, they lifted a large item out of the well. Immediately upon lifting it out of the well, the volunteer said that they were hit with a smell of rot and death. It ended up being two crates that were tied together with both open ends facing each other to create a sealed box. The ends were then tied with a copper wire. 
around the entire thing, there was a chain which had been connected together with three different padlocks, 12 zip ties, and eight metal wires. The milk crates were then weighed down in that well with 18 large rocks. Altogether, the firefighters estimated that the crate and everything inside weighed about 70 to 80 pounds. Of course, it was a process to get all the chains and padlocks and zip ties removed to finally look inside those milk crates. But once they did, they were horrified at what they found. They found Dylan's tiny little body wrapped in six layers of plastic wrap that had been sealed with duct tape and zip ties. He was then placed inside that milk crate along with all those rocks to weigh the crate down. It was then chained shut before being thrown into that well. Absolutely horrific. After retrieving Dylan's body from the well, the medical examiner performed an autopsy. It was found that Dylan had suffered multiple skull fractures. He had a fracture to his left humerus or his left upper arm bone. He had fractures in the left radius and ulna or his forearm bones. He had fractures in his left tibia as well as fractures on his sixth and seventh ribs. The skull fractures were in various stages of healing, meaning that they were sustained at all different times from multiple different incidences. The rib fractures were mostly healed, meaning they were also old fractures which occurred some time before the arm fractures. In addition to all of these broken bones, baby Dylan was found to have bruising on the right side of his chest and left arm and legs, and there was a laceration on his left arm. The medical examiner determined that Dylan had suffered from blunt force trauma. The exact cause of death couldn't be determined due to the level of decomposition from being submerged in the water for so long. However, the ME stated that Dylan suffered from at least three different episodes of blunt force trauma due to the nature of the bone fractures. They also found presence of methamphetamines in Dylan's liver. It was determined that Dylan's manner of death was homicidal violence because there's no other way these injuries could have been sustained. Of course, this is all just so heartbreaking and tragic. It's clear that Dylan was horrifically abused in his short time on this earth. The same father that apparently fought to keep this baby in his custody either hit the baby or allowed him to be abused by his mother, both of which are just unforgivable. Then, somehow, during those visits with Patricia, they were able to cover for what they were doing. After the discovery of Dylan's body and as the autopsy was being conducted, officers also took then 15-year-old Daniel Jr. in for questioning. Daniel Jr. told officers that sometime in April, before his removal from the home, he did notice the bruising and swelling on Dylan's head. Daniel Jr. asked his parents what caused it, and they told him that he was playing with a dream catcher, but it got stuck on his arm, and he swung his arm and then hit himself in the head with a stone that was attached to the dream catcher. But at the time of the interview, Daniel Jr. said that he didn't think that's what actually caused this injury. He was, again, 15 at the time. He's smarter than that. Then he admitted to officers that every couple of months, he would give his urine to his father both before and after Dylan's birth. Daniel would then put the urine in a sealed bottle and take it with him. Clearly, it can be deduced that Daniel may have been taking his son's urine and using that to pass his drug tests. At this point, based on everything we've heard, both Jessica and Daniel were charged with several felony charges, including murder, aggravated murder, kidnapping, child endangerment, tampering with evidence, interference with custody, abuse of a corpse, and assault. Both pleaded not guilty to their charges, and by January 6, 2020, the trial for both Daniel and Jessica began. The prosecution explained everything that happened in Dylan's life from before he was even born. How Jessica and Daniel showed up to the hospital, appearing flat, unemotional, and completely disconnected from what was happening. Jessica gave birth never once asking about the well-being of her baby or showing interest in him. He immediately showed signs of drug withdrawal and tested positive for various substances, showing that Jessica also didn't care about her baby throughout her entire pregnancy. She also admitted that she was taking heroin while pregnant. He was sent off for further medical care, and when he was, Daniel went and checked on him once in the nursery. But other than that, he couldn't care less, and neither could Jessica. 
After baby Dylan was taken away, Daniel fought to have him back, which was granted because the system believed that he was clean while Jessica wasn't. She was the problem here. Daniel promised that Jessica wouldn't be around the baby, but that was a lie. According to what we just heard, Daniel let her live with them and let her around the baby despite her drug use. Why? Probably because Daniel also was using drugs, but just did a better job of hiding it. According to what we heard earlier, he most likely used his teenage son's pee to pass those drug tests because the tests weren't being properly conducted. After a few months of these home visits, all of a sudden, they got real flaky and started dodging their visits until they just completely stopped showing up. At some point after the March 28th visit, Daniel died at the hands of his parents. However, it's likely that the abuse started before that because as we know, he had new and old healing injuries occurring over at least three different incidences. So my thoughts are that the abuse probably started in February or early March, which is around the time that they were needing extra time between those visits, probably to allow those bruises to heal. But again, his caseworker never noticed any obvious injuries and he looked healthy. But if his bruises kept healing before those visits, I guess that explains why. Or maybe Jessica and Daniel were dressing Dylan in onesies that covered him pretty much from his neck down to his arms and legs that would cover any injuries he had on his body. And if the caseworker wasn't taking his clothes off and checking under his clothes, that could also be how she missed those bruises. I haven't seen explained if she did remove his clothing during these visits or if she just kind of looked at him with his clothes on. We don't really know that aspect, but of course, if she didn't take those steps, that's a huge missed opportunity to see if he was being abused. But either way, after suffering for weeks, if not months of abuse at the hands of his parents, sometime after that March 28th visit, Jessica and Daniel took the abuse too far and murdered their precious baby. This is all what the prosecution was arguing. Baby Dylan was delivered within approximately 30 minutes and the testimony will be that that delivery was uneventful. Not long after birth, baby Dylan was taken to the nursery and put on oxygen because he was born early and needed support. The testimony will be that neither parent accompanied that baby to the nursery. After the baby died, they then took their baby's body, wrapped it in plastic, and then sealed it with duct tape and zip ties. They then put him into two milk crates and tied them together, weighing them down with rocks and wrapping it in chains, padlocks, and more zip ties to ensure it wouldn't be discovered. They then tried to elude their caseworker and authorities for as long as possible to cover up what they did. These defendants dumped him in a dark, 30-foot well of water and left him there for months. You listen to the whispering. If they find his body, we're effed. These two defendants wrapped that baby boy in six layers of plastic and duct tape and chained his body inside a milk crate, loaded it on a four-wheeler, and drove it and dumped it in a well. A chain, three padlocks, 12 zip ties, eight wire ties, 18 rocks, six layers of plastic and duct tape. Does this look like panic? I submit to you it looks like extreme planning. This is what they chose for a coffin and his burial? This? And then they dumped him in a well. Again, this is everything that the prosecution was arguing. On the other hand though, the defense was actually arguing that Jessica and Jessica alone is responsible for baby Dylan's death. They argued that Dylan had nothing to do with it. He was foolishly unaware of what Jessica was doing to their baby. The only things he's guilty of is helping Jessica wrap the body, getting rid of it, and covering up for what he did. That's it, no big deal. At the trial, Jessica actually took the stand to testify to her version of what happened. She said that she, and only she, caused the death of Dylan. She said that she caused the various injuries to Dylan and hid them from Daniel. But when she was under cross-examination and she was asked how she caused the injuries to the baby, she said she didn't remember. 
the rib fractures, the head injuries. Everything must have been caused by dropping him. She said that nothing she did was intentional. These answers were not enough for the prosecution, so they asked her how she truly killed that baby without just saying it was an accident, but she refused to answer. She skated around the specific questions, just saying that it was an accident and that she has to live with what happened for the rest of her life. This was a very heated exchange with the prosecution. It was very frustrating to watch and even more frustrating for the prosecutor. Tell the jury how you killed this baby. It was an accident. Not your excuse. How did you murder this baby? How did you cause these injuries? I have sit here and admitted. Answer the question, please. How did you cause these injuries? It was an accident. Not your excuse for what happened. How did you cause these injuries? How did you cause those rib fractures? By dropping him. By dropping him. How did you cause this, that first two-inch skull fracture? I don't remember. How did you cause that one-inch skull fracture? It had to be from dropping him. How did you cause that complete upper arm fracture? Nothing that I ever did was intentional. I'm not asking for your excuse. How did you cause that complete upper arm fracture? Tell the jury. I have to live with this for the rest of Answer my the life. How did you cause that complete You have devoured Ma my family. Ms. Ms. Rose, you answer the questions that are asked of you. You understand? I've admitted to my guilt. How did you and I have to live without my children. I'm thing. done talking to you. You are talking to me because you're sitting on the witness stand. Tell them how you caused that injury. Judge, I'm asking you to instruct the witness to answer the question. Ms. Rose, by testifying, you're subject to cross-examination. You have to answer the questions on cross-examination that are relevant to these proceedings. This question is a relevant question. You will answer the question at this time. What is your answer to the last question? <laughs> Council approach. The details she did give were that the injuries Daniel sustained happened on March 27th and that he finally died from them on the 28th. She then kept his body in the home for a few days before wrapping him in plastic and dumping his body in the well, but she doesn't remember the exact details of wrapping his body. She said that through all of this, she didn't have a clear mind because of the drugs, but again, nothing she did was intentional. Then when Dylan took the stand, he said that he did not know that Jessica had been abusing the baby this whole time. He did see bruises on his head once, the same bruises their teenage son noticed, but he didn't think they were from abuse. He thought that it was from the dream catcher incident. He also admitted at one point that he would see Jessica becoming agitated and get rough with Dylan when he would cry, but he would just give her cocaine to calm her down. So I guess that helped and he didn't think anything else of it, even though, again, he said earlier in the interviews with police that he didn't know that Jessica was on drugs. Obviously, we know that was a lie, but... Now he's just fully admitting that he would give her cocaine to calm her down. Daniel said that he only knew his son was dead after finding him in his crib days after the actual death occurred, which makes no sense that if you're an attentive father and you don't know what your wife is doing to the baby and you know that she probably shouldn't be around him alone, apparently you didn't see him for days because you didn't know he was dead for several days. I guess that makes sense. But he said that once he found him, panic set in, which resulted in chaos and confusion, causing him to make foolish and poor decisions. He was afraid that DCFS would blame him for Dylan's death. So he decided to cover up what happened rather than reporting it. Under oath, he admitted to helping Jessica hide the body. He helped create that milk crate box. He wrapped it in chains and helped weigh it down with rocks before dumping it. 
He also said that he was struggling with drug abuse at the time, so that contributes to his unclear thinking and why he did what he did. However, one thing I want to note is that he said he never lied on a drug test. He said that when he got his son's urine, it was for a friend who needed to pass the test. He never lied and actually passed those tests for real. But again, I don't believe him at all. At the trial, the jury heard from the nurses present on the day of Dylan's birth, various caseworkers who worked directly with the family, Dylan's foster mother, who was just absolutely torn up about the whole thing, as well as their teenage son. They heard from the medical examiner and the volunteers who found the body. And after five days of testimony, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury of 12 were sent off for deliberations. They came back and found that Jessica Groves is in fact guilty of charges of aggravated murder, kidnapping, abuse of a corpse, evidence tampering, and assault. For this, she was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Then, Daniel Groves was found not guilty of aggravated murder, but he was guilty of murder, abuse of a corpse, evidence tampering, kidnapping, and assault. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 47 years. In the case of State of Ohio versus Daniel Groves, case number 19 CR 586A, jury has returned their verdict. Jury is to count one, aggravated murder. We, the jury, having been duly impaneled, find the defendant, Daniel A. Groves, not guilty of count one of the indictment, aggravated murder. As to count two, murder. The jury is found. We, the jury, having been duly impaneled, further find beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant, Daniel A. Groves, guilty of count two of the indictment, murder. As to the case of State of Ohio versus Jessica Groves, case number 19 CR, as to count one of the indictment, charge aggravated murder, the jury is found. We, the jury, having been duly impaneled, find beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant, Jessica Groves, guilty of count one of the indictment, aggravated murder. Ms. Jessica Groves, anything you'd like to say before I impose sentence? I'm just so very sorry. No matter what you do to me, you can never do what I will do with myself. What I have to live with for the rest of my life, knowing that I did this to my child. I failed as a mother. I'm sorry. Anything else you'd like to say? Defendant mm -hmm. Daniel Groves, will you please stand? As to count two of the indictment, you have been found guilty of the charge of murder. I will sentence you to the prescribed term of imprisonment for that offense of 15 years to life would be my intention by imposing this sentence to impose a term of 47 years to life in the custody of Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. You can be seated. Defendant Jessica Groves, will you please stand? Ma'am, you stand convicted of the charge of aggravated murder. It will be the sentence of this court that you be sentenced to a term of imprisonment of life without the possibility of parole as to count one of the indictment. It would be my intention to impose a sentence of life without the possibility of parole plus an additional 32 years as part of this sentence. You can be seated. Of course, both have filed appeals, but as of right now, they have all been denied. Of course, in the aftermath of Dylan's death, people are outraged about how the Department of Family and Child Services allowed this to happen. He was literally born with hard drugs in his system, then placed in a foster home who loved him and cared for him, only to be given back to the parents who clearly did not want him. This was done all under the promise that Jessica would be kept away all while she completed various drug treatments and parenting classes. Daniel was also supposed to stay clean. However, we know that Jessica was not consistent with her counseling or classes. We know that Daniel's tests were not conducted properly. It seemed that Dylan's caseworker was at least relatively on top of getting into contact and trying to visit the family to physically see Dylan. 
but somehow she still missed the red flags. She didn't really speak to the teenage son alone until after Dylan had been missing for a while, and it somehow took months to figure out that something went horribly wrong. There were so many missed opportunities for Dylan to be taken away, but they were all missed. And one thing I really have questions about is the dates in this whole thing. Again, Daniel and Jessica both say that the abuse happened on March 27th and he died on the 28th, yet there was a home visit on the 28th. So what happened there? Maybe Dylan was sleeping and he looked just fine to the caseworker, didn't appear to have injuries, or maybe because he was sleeping, she didn't want to wake him up to remove his clothes or whatever. It is possible that he was suffering internally from abuse and that he didn't appear on the outside to be like dying, I guess. It just makes me wonder how the caseworker missed it if this timeline is accurate. If he really died on the 28th, that means he died just hours after this home visit was conducted. And that makes absolutely no sense to me. So to me, either the timeline is wrong or the caseworker just ignored or just didn't see the red flag somehow. I have no idea how that would have happened, but that's just, I guess, what's being reported. So I don't really know what to think of that. Either way, it will never make sense to me why children are taken away from amazing foster families and are given right back to the parents who allowed them to be born with drugs in their system and who clearly do not care about the well being of their child. That is not something that should be taken lightly. Yet so often, the system seems to place emphasis on getting kids back with their biological parents rather than trying to ensure the actual safety of the child. It's so frustrating that it seems that the needs and wants of these parents are put above the safety of the child. It needs to change and it needs to stop happening. It's tragic and devastating and it never should have happened, but you all know that just as well as I do. So that is where I'm going to end today's case. I know this was a rough one to get through, but as soon as I heard Dylan's horrific story, I knew that I needed to discuss it with you all. And now I wanna hear what you all think about this case. Why do you think Dylan was placed back into Daniel's care? Do you think he was truly off drugs at the time and wanted to care for his son? Do you think Daniel was involved in his son's death or was it all Jessica? Do you think he knew about the abuse? Do you think that his death was an accident or was it by Jessica abusing him? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.